Welcome to Rwanda Television News and the news in details. President Paul Kagame has noted that the bilateral relations between Rwanda and India have continued to flourish and that two countries are looking to deepen that, relation, that relationship. The Rwandan president met the remarks during the year's Raisin a Dialogue, meant to address global issues. This year, the focus is on the COVID-19 pandemic and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is also attending. During the virtual discussions, President Paul Kagame pointed out just how serious the global pandemic has become. COVID is a public health crisis, but it is also a crisis of international cooperation. Access to vaccines is highly unequal. In a situation of scarcity, power and wealth will always set to the temple. India, despite its own challenges, has produced most of vaccine doses sent to Africa under COVAX and related programs. Without India's production capacity and spirit of solidarity, it is possible that Africa would not yet have received much vaccine at all. This unsustainable situation demonstrates the opportunity for more ambitious private sector investments between India and Africa in pharmaceutical manufacturing, among other areas. The relationship between India and Rwanda continues to flourish, and our goal is to further deepen our ties. Rwanda and India continues to collaborate on important infrastructure and development initiatives. The key objective is to increase the educational and employment opportunities available to young people in both India and Rwanda. Knowledge, innovation, and the green economy will still be the key drivers of growth after the pandemic. The Observer Research Foundation's annual Kigali Global Dialogue is another good example. This event brings a fresh perspective to global debates on development and growth and attests to increasing multipolarity of our world. Now, Senate President o Dr. Auguste Iamremi has called on all Rwandans to preserve the legacy of the politicians who chose to die rather than join forces with a murderous regime that prepared and executed the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi. Now, the Senate President met the call during a ceremony at the Rebero Genocide Memorial Site, ending week-long mourning activities all at national level. Serge Nwari has more on this report. The memorial site is the final resting place of more than 14,000 people killed during the 1994 genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi, including 12 politicians that would not support the murderous regime of the time. Officials speaking at the ceremony to remember and honor the courage of the politicians and other individuals who died rather than join in the atrocities noted that the bravery of such individuals does not change the name or the nature of the genocide against the Tutsi. Rwandans, brothers and sisters, we do not need the international community or anyone else for that matter to remind us that we must honor and remember those who were killed because they would not support the genocide or because they tried to save the Tutsi that were being targeted for extermination. Everybody knows that genocide implies an attempt to completely exterminate a group of people because of their tribe, nationality, race or language. Therefore, the genocide against the Tutsi targeted them because of their tribe. The politicians and other individuals who were killed because they resisted that evil agenda were killed because of their ideologies, not their tribe. There should be no debate about that fact. The genocide targeted the Tutsi and we also remember the politicians and others who were killed because they sought to resist it. But that does not change the name of the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi. Other speakers at the event pointed out that between 1990 and 1994, the party MRND and former President Juvenal Habjarimana formed other parties to support their genocidal agenda, including what was called Hutu Power, 
that brought together extremist politicians in other parties, effectively silencing those who did not support their agenda. And that resulted in their being killed when the genocide against the Tutsi began. It was also pointed out that there are people abroad who call themselves politicians and are actively campaigning in support of such evil policies, which is why the youth especially should be careful. After the genocide, perpetrators were defeated and fled the country. They deceived themselves into believing that they could use politics to wind their way back to power and not be held accountable for what they had done. They started with a party they called the RDR, claiming that the killings involved all tribes, blaming the RPF in Hotsunyi for triggering the atrocities, saying they are the ones that shot down that plane and that is why the massacres began. That was the RDR's policy, and it repeatedly stated this in different documents. It called the legacy of history. The negation of the genocide against the Tutsi that is currently ongoing on social media sites like YouTube and others, through different writers that include foreigners like Judy River, Michaela Wong and others, is the same thing we find in the words of the RDR. These sorts of ideologies that negate and deny the genocide against the Tutsi while at the same time tarnishing the name of the RPF in Hotani that stopped that genocide, those ideologies that spread lies, actually surprise some who do not realize that they are part of a much older strategy that was part of the genocide against the Tutsi and now seeks to negate it. The relatives of the politicians buried at Rebeiro say the 13th of April is an important day for them. Today was set aside to remember them and help us continue their legacy. They gave the all for the country, knowing they could be killed. This is important to us because it helps us to follow their example and continue fighting those that negate and deny the genocide that was perpetrated against the Tutsi. The call was also made for all Rwandans to take a stand. I ask that we continue the legacy of the good politicians we remember today, striving that the genocide never happens again denouncing those that deny and negate the genocide against the Tutsi and those that support them. That will give purpose to our objective of remembering while building ourselves up. All of those buried at the memorial site were killed in Kigali City. Some of the people who survived the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in different areas of Nyamirambo say the killings that took place at Setandre at the Karori Luanga parish saw Tarsis Renzaho play an active role in making sure it was done. He was Kigali's prefect at the time, uh, or what we would now call the mayor. Gloria Motesi has more. Nyamirambo is one of the most densely populated areas of Kigali. Survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi explained that insecurity often characterized the area, even before the genocide. Rutijana Innocent was one of the first to flee to the parish on April 7, 1994. <laughs> After the plane crashed, there was insecurity and we sought refuge here with some other people. We found other people that had also come to seek refuge since January that year. There were people from Jitega, Jikondo, Nyamirambo. All of them had come to seek refuge here because there was a lot of instability in Kigali then. Rutijana emphasizes that on different days and dates, Tutsis who had taken refuge at St. Andrew's School in the parish of Kaloli Ranga and in the Freire were killed, saying he was able to leave and move to the parish where he was injured. He, however, says that even those that had sought refuge there were killed, and as luck would have it, he was among those that were rescued by the Imhotanyi. I was injured in the attack when they threw grenades at us. My legs and my back were injured, but by God's grace I didn't die. Later, they came checking to see who had died or survived. So we decided to walk up to Rebero in the night looking for Imhotani because we had been told that that's where they were. Along the way, we encountered Inherahamwe militia and we lost two of our people who didn't make it to Rebero. That's how I survived. Rutijana 
Brother Munana Jean Paul was one of the people at the ferry at the time of the attacks and was also among the hunted. He recounts that brutality of the killers was excessive because even though he was able to hide, what he saw was horrible. The RPF in Hotani rescued people from various locations in Nyamirambo, coming down from Lebero Hill and the Parliament Building in Kachiru, or CND as it was known then. The president of Ibuka in Nyarujanje district, Rutaisire Masengo, says that the massacres in Nyamirambo had the former leaders in Kigali as the masterminds behind them. They first came to kill people and later they came back to finish their mission. But as they came back, they got distracted by a cow that they slaughtered and shared the meat. That's how that day went by, and that's also the day the RPF in Hwatanyi came and rescued the people that had remained there. Among the people that gave the command to kill included Renzaho Tarsis, and another one called Munyakazi, who gave permission to the Inherahamwe to start killing the Tutsi in that area. The thousands of Tutsi killed in various parts of Nyamirambo are among the 45,000 people killed in Nyarujanja district in total of which 37,000 have been found and given a decent burial. As we continue in the commemoration, we strive that we continue the unity of Rwandans, but also look for information of where the bodies of those who perished in the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi could be, so they can be accorded a decent burial, which is why we have set up a unity and reconciliation program at the cell level, and we believe that we will get the information of all that perished in the genocide. Although many people from Nyamirambo perished in the 1994 genocide against against the Tutsi. The survivors say 27 years later, a lot has been done to improve the people's well-being and that they are continuing on the journey of unity and reconciliation. In collaboration with the security forces operating in Rusizi district, 12 people, including one woman, have been arrested on suspicion of armed robbery, killing one person and injuring another, and extorting more than 3 million Rwandan francs from the locals at the various times, but consecutively since the end of last year up until March 2021. Now, residents reported that they now feel safe after hearing that the thieves have been arrested. Among those who were robbed is Teogen Nauchiriwabo, a resident of Hombo sector who was robbed of 705,000 Rwandan francs on the 22nd of December 2020. Just five days later, on Sunday, the robbers went to a Vugameshi Fidel's house in Jihongwe sector, killing his wife, Olive Nirandai Senga, and taking 470,000 Rwandan francs. Murenzi Boniface, one of the robbers who has been brought forward as the one who did the shooting wherever they went, admitted to shooting the woman at her husband's conspiracy as neighbors affirm that they were having conflicts between them. He had promised them 500,000 Rwandan francs of which they collected from their house in form of robbery. He had promised us that amount and he also asked us to take his cell phone as well in order for the robbery to look real. When we arrived at his house, he came outside and briefed us that we should do it as quickly as possible and be done by 9 p.m. We first tied him in order to look the part, and as we entered the house, he showed us where the money was. On February 11, 2021, Joel Nsabimana of Mururu sector was shot and robbed 50,000 Rwandan francs. And on March 27 this year, Habimana Ezekiel of Kamembe sector was robbed 2 million Rwandan francs as he suspected that his colleagues in a livestock business to have connived with the robbers to rob him since they had been having conflicts for days. <laughs> They made us lie down on our bellies as they tied our hands, and they called me out by my name, I answered. And they told me that my colleagues have sent them to kill me, but the only way to let me live is if I give them my money. As for the guns, the only woman imprisoned with 11 men confessed to have given the gun to Boniface at the request of her father who had bought it in Congo and bought it with the dowry money which had been paid for her as she was soon to be wed in a few days. 
I gave him the gun because he shared it with my father. My father was imprisoned on November 30th after he was put in jail. He called me on the phone and asked me not to give it to Boniface because he could take it for good. And instead, he suggested I give it to my brother, who afterwards refused to take it. In the end, Boniface came and took it. The spokesperson of RIB, Dr. Murangira Thierry, explained how they were caught. We captured them with the help of security forces operating in Rusizi district. For a while, these crimes were being placed on the security forces because the robbers were disguising themselves as one of them using military uniform. But we are now relieved that they have been exposed. We were very scared because we were worried these acts of violence would continue if they are still out there on the loose. But we are now relieved that they have been exposed. They are being prosecuted for arms possession and trafficking, armed robbery, murder, criminal gripping and embezzlement, unauthorized use of public works and unauthorized use of clothing to mislead the public, of which the minimum sentence is five years in prison and the maximum is life imprisonment. All 12 face a life sentence if found guilty. Almost 10 years after the end of the Gachacha courts, some of the survivors of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi are worried about the pending implementation of court rulings regarding the compensation for their properties. Gloria Motesi continues with this story. 27 years after the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, some survivors say they are saddened that they have not been compensated for their property after the Gachacha courts ruled out on the issue almost 10 years ago. The problem we have is that we haven't been compensated for our assets. They keep hiding what they have to pay us. For instance, they're supposed to pay me 1.1 million and they still haven't paid. They say non-payment of their property damage during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi is hindering the process of unity and reconciliation between them and the perpetrators. Until they can compensate us for what the court ruled on, then we can promote unity and reconciliation and live in harmony after they've played their part. Those that have paid back what they damaged testify that this has given them peace of mind. After the court made its ruling, I started paying back to the one whose property I damaged. I had to pay back 264,762 Rwanda francs. The unity and reconciliation comes about after compensating them so they no longer look at me with fault. The Ministry of Justice says that among the obstacles to the execution of court rulings on the compensation of property damage during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi include misplaced rulings, a problem of identifying for those that damaged the property and missing persons. The head of access to Justice Department, who is also the principal state attorney, Martin Urujeni says that during this fiscal year, the objective is for all Gachacha court rulings to be implemented, but that there's also the need to go case by case and identify the obstacles they face. That is to say that there's no reason as to why we should still be having the other cases that were already ruled on and meet all the requirements. Among the goals districts have is to finalize these cases that were heard by the Gachacha courts and that's what they are doing. And they're also looking at the cases that don't have all the requirements so that a decision can also be made regarding those based on their nature and origin. So that's where we currently are. The Ministry of Justice says between 2002 and 2012, Gachacha courts made rulings on 1,320,554 cases to do with property damaged or destroyed during the genocide against the Tutsi. As of November last year, 97.5% of those cases had been carried out, with the remaining 2.5% made up of 2,155 case rulings that meet all requirements that have not yet been executed, and another 30,121 that are pending because they do not have all that is necessary for them to be implemented. 
All 56,841 cases have been heard by the courts in Rwanda through the use of technology in the past one year despite the challenges that have been identified along the way. On January 1st, 2016, the judicial system launched an integrated electronic case management system where people would report cases online and that would be followed up there. However, in April last year is when courts started conducting proceedings through the use of technology, something that has been well received by some members of the public despite some indications that there are still challenges. Most people don't have smartphones, for instance myself. I lost the one I had. Having these cases followed up online is a good initiative, but we still have a challenge following the proceedings without smartphones. Lawyers, on the other hand, say they are happy that the pandemic has not completely halted the judicial services, regardless of the significant obstacles that still exist in the online system's infrastructure. There are definitely challenges in the use of technology. There are times we can't access internet in the courts, or you could be having internet but the other party doesn't have it, which results into postponing the case and the clients would prefer face-to-face -face proceedings because then you're able to have a conversation with them rather than when it's online, where sometimes they feel like they didn't get justice. Up to date, trials have been had using Skype, Zoom, among other things, with documents being sent online as well. The judicial spokesperson says that the lessons learned from the use of this technology over the past year have shown that even without pandemics, improvements are still made, especially in infrastructure, to provide better services in the courts. <laughs> The use of technology in the judicial sector will continue and more effort shall be put in where there are loopholes as well as improved infrastructure so that we improve service delivery to all Rwandans and everyone in general. From April 2020 to March 2021, 87,687 lawsuits were filed with the courts through the use of technology, while 35,106 criminal cases were ruled on, and an additional 21,735 civil cases all ruled using technology. On behalf of the entire news production team, thank you so much for staying with us. Enjoy the rest of the week as we commemorate for the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. I am Jane Mutoni. Bye for now.